Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you the daily tonic is a five minute newsletter that shares science-backed health news and tips all while getting you to crack a smile or even laugh out loud on occasion it's a daily morning newsletter started by wellness lovers for wellness lovers that covers everything from diet and exercise to morning routines and sleep aids to subscribe Go to 247health.com and click on the Daily Tonic button at the top of the webpage. When you go to 247health.com to subscribe to the Daily Tonic newsletter, be sure to check out their product reviews and special recipes. There you can find reviews on the latest health technology that will improve your performance, your recovery, and your longevity. 247health.com believes that wellness is a personal journey, but it's always good to have a friend who knows what they're talking about, too. Give them a try at 247health.com. Did you know many of 247health.com's favorite products, like avocado oil mayonnaise, hydrating ketone water, skin revitalizing red light lamps, all are featured on the Daily Tonic with discount codes? If you see a cool new product on the website, there's probably a special link on the Daily Tonic. Plus, the Daily Tonic also features new wellness products with special discounts every single day. To subscribe, go to 247health.com and click on the Daily Tonic button at the top of the webpage. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Andrew Dessler. He's a professor at uh, Texas a and M, part of the uh, Center for Climate Studies. He holds a uh, Retta A. Haynes Chair in Geosciences, and we're going to talk about his work. So, Andrew, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Doing good. Thanks for having me. If you would, tell me about your, your current work and uh, maybe a bit about your history, how you got into this position. Sure. So I am a professor of atmospheric sciences here at Texas A&M. And, my, you know, if you're a faculty member at a university, you teach classes and you also do research. And uh, most of my research is on climate change. And I mainly, uh, or I, I, up until recently, mainly did work on the physical climate system, like trying to understand how clouds change as the climate warms and how that would amplify the warming from carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we're dumping the atmosphere. It's sort, sort of the physics of the climate. Um, and I've, I've, recently changed to focus more on the impacts of the climate, how climate change is going to affect humans, because I think we understand the physics of the climate system well enough. We know what we're doing to the climate system. Now, the real question is, how are humans going to react to it? And how is it going to affect humanity? And so what are you modeling now? Are you still modeling the climate itself? Or what, uh, you know, what does your research look like? Oh, right. So I've got a couple of different projects going right now. Um, in one project, we're trying to estimate how many people die from extreme heat. And we're doing this statistically by looking at basically death records. So pe- we keep pretty good records of people of the number of people who die every day. And then we correlate that with temperature. And sure enough, we see that as temperatures go up, more people die. And so we can quantify Uh, We want to quantify that and then use that to predict what's going to happen in the future as we continue to warm the planet. uh, You know, how many deaths is that going to cause 
And is it possible for humans to adapt to that warmer temperature? So we also look at that. On another project, we're looking at the energy grid, particularly the Texas energy grid. I live in Texas, so I'm interested in the Texas grid. Plus, the Texas grid is unique because it's its own island. It's not connected to the national grids. So it's, it's a little bit easier to analyze the data. And we find is that as the climate warms, people are spending a lot more energy on electricity because they've got to cool their house. And as the demand goes up, the price of energy goes up. So uh, looking at what's effectively a climate tax that everybody is paying in the form of higher electricity costs. Are you looking at uh, also what about cold? You know, just about two years ago in Texas, it was freezing here for a week and a half. Power was out, all that stuff. Are you looking at uh, cold deaths and, and the effect of cold as well or just heat? Yeah, so we, we look at deaths in both the, the hot season and the cold season. And as you would expect, as the climate warms, you get fewer deaths uh, when the temperature is cold. And uh, that basically about matches the number of extra deaths you get from heat up until you get about two degrees of warming over the whole globe. So global average warming. And then when you get beyond that, the number of, of heat-related deaths really starts to increase rapidly, and you don't get that same rapid decrease in cold deaths. So the, the, the lives lost due to extreme heat dominates, and you end up with this net loss. But uh, at least if for the next degree of warming that we're going to experience, they base, the, the, the lives saved from less cold basically cancels the extra lives lost due to heat. But that's not going to happen forever. As I said, as the temperature gets even warmer, eventually the lives lost due to extreme heat will dominate. Yeah, from what I understand, there's uh, well over 10 times the amount of deaths from cold than it is from heat you know, as of now. Right. So, I mean, so that's a, yeah, so that's a statistic you see a lot. And, you know, I could go, I could go into great detail about that. Uh, a lot of those deaths are occurring at temperatures that are not extreme. So if you look at the data, what you, you see that the, the optimal temperature for people to live at is about, is in the low 70s. And as the temperature gets down to 65 degrees, you actually see more people dying at 65 than at 72 degrees, which is really kind of weird because you don't, you wouldn't think that that would make a big difference, but you can actually see that in the data. And so as the climate warms, the, you will save the, a few lives there at 65 or 70. And if you count those as cold deaths, then, yeah, you get about 10, 10 times as many cold deaths as, as warm deaths. So as I said, when the temperature, well, if we continue warming the climate, we will get to a point where the increase in warm deaths vastly outpaces the decrease in cold deaths. Yeah, that's what's modeled so far, right? It hasn't happened. Uh, when do you think that uh, the two-degree warming will be here? How long will well, that's it take? A good, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think it depends on uh, what we do, what humanity does. So we have we have the choice right now of what kind of future we want to live in. It's not at all set in stone sort of what the trajectory of the climate is going to be. You know, on the one hand, we could basically not do much about climate change to try to head off climate change. And I should just say for all of your listeners who may not be following the climate debate that closely, climate change occurs primarily from burning fossil fuels, natural gas, oil. When you burn them, you release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That warms the climate. So if we just keep doing that, the climate's going to keep warming, and we'll go through two degrees somewhere in the middle of this century. On the other hand, we, can't, we, we have the capability, the technology, to largely start transitioning away from fossil fuels today. Wind and solar are now the cheapest energy we have, and if you look at a state like Texas, we are building enormous amounts of renewable energy, not because people here are Birkenstock wearing hippies. It's because the energy people in Texas want to make money and you make money with renewable energy today. And so um, so the, the cheapest energy is wind and solar. And we, we have the technology to largely start transitioning away from fossil fuels. And we just have to decide what we're going to do if we are smart and we start transitioning away from fossil fuels immediately, we might never hit two degrees. It just depends on what we choose to do. How, how are we going to trans move away from wind and solar when it's a vast minority of all power and it needs backups at night and substantial battery backup and everything? 
Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question. So let me explain to you one way the U.S. could transition away from largely transition away from fossil fuels on our electric energy grid. So one way you could do it is you shut down all the coal and uh, you leave the natural gas system intact and you build a lot of wind and solar. Okay, so you have a power system which is which has existing natural gas power and has wind and solar. Now, for most of the time, you never need to run the natural gas system. You're just generating power of the wind and solar. And, you know, wind and solar tend to be anti-correlated so that when the sun is producing a lot, the wind may not be, but when the wind is producing a lot, the sun is not necessarily. So it's combined, wind and solar give you much more constant power. But there will be periods when neither of them are producing. And when that happens, that's when you run the natural gas system. And it turns out that you need to run natural gas. People, people have done very detailed modeling of this. You need to run the natural gas system about 10% of the time. So if we, so we could, just with our existing natural gas infrastructure, if we built some more wind and solar, we could have a 90% clean grid a grid that's 90% renewable, you would still have reliable energy, it'd still be there anytime you flip the switch, and it would cost about the same as we're paying today. So, I mean, let me be clear, we have the technology to do this. You know, one of the biggest, uh, as I see it, one of the biggest problems facing society right now is people don't understand that we have the capability to largely switch away from fossil fuels now. You know, it's like, uh, they don't understand that, that wind and solar are cheap, they don't understand how much research has been done about how you design a grid that runs on variable renewable energy that still is reliable and is not very expensive. Well, what happened here in Texas just about two years ago? They had a substantial amount of wind and solar. It was freezing, it was snowing, the whole thing went down. Yeah, so the natural gas system. And it was just black. Yeah, so the, the, right. So the main problem is the natural gas system failed. That was a fossil fuel failure. You know, wind and solar. Uh, did not produce a lot, but we didn't expect the wind and the uh, wind and solar to produce that much at that time. We were really relying on fossil fuels, and they failed. Oh, I mean, Aaron, from what I had seen from ERCAD, it was not that. It was the exact opposite. And the fossil fuels were there, but the uh, wind and solar had no backup as per law. So when they went out, we were in deficit. Yeah, so we didn't have enough fossil fuels to make up the power on the grid. Yeah, that's 100% wrong. Uh, fossil fuels were absolutely the cause of the failure. It, it was not, I mean, it, it is true that the renewable, the variable energy didn't bail us out. You know, wind and solar didn't make up for the loss of natural gas, but it was, I mean, we lost 30 gigawatts of, of thermal gas. I mean, you know, out of 80 gigawatts of power, uh, it was, it, you know, it was, it was 100% or 90% nat- uh, fossil fuel problems. Small, a small. You can put a small part of the blame on wind. Solar actually did pretty well. It did solar do well though? Because it was covered with snow. I don't understand. I mean, if you look at the data, it did pretty. I mean, obviously, it's only producing during the daytime, but it, you know, over the period of the blackout, it was producing about as expected. Okay. So, what, what uh, are you working with various grids to try to add wind and solar, or what? What is your research about at this moment? Yeah, so I've got a couple of research projects going on where it comes to um, the grid. So one project, which we're wrapping up, is looking at uh, the impact of climate change on the forecasts of power. So just to give you an example, ERCOT, that runs the Texas grid, they do not take into account climate change when they make their forecasts. So, you know, when they're making seasonal forecasts, how hot is it going to get this coming summer? How cold is it going to get the following winter? Uh, they're not including climate change in any of those forecasts, which is just insane. Um, and it's one of the reasons why the ERCOT grid is always so close to failure, because there's just not enough power and uh, because their forecasts don't, don't include the fact that the world is getting warmer. So they chronically underestimate demand, particularly in the summer. In the winter, not so much, but definitely in the summer, they're underestimating demand. The other thing we're looking at is price that people pay for electricity has been driven by climate change. So, you know, when the climate warms, two things happen. So the first thing that happens is demand goes up because people have to run their air conditioners more. So so that means you're definitely paying more for electricity just because you have to run your air conditioner more. It turns out that's about 4% 
per degree Celsius. So about 2% per degree Fahrenheit. So, so that's, that's an effect. It's not a huge effect, but it is an effect. But then the other thing that happens is in Texas, the way the ERCOT energy market works, the price you pay for power goes up with the demand. And I can explain why if you're interested in that, but just take it from me. That yeah, as- go ahead. The Daily Tonic is a five-minute newsletter that shares science-backed health news and tips, all while getting you to crack a smile or even laugh out loud on occasion. It's a daily morning newsletter started by wellness lovers for wellness lovers that covers everything from diet and exercise to morning routines and sleep aids. To subscribe, go to 247health.com and click on the Daily Tonic button at the top of the webpage. When you go to 247health.com to subscribe to the Daily Tonic newsletter, be sure to check out their product reviews and special recipes. There you can find reviews on the latest health technology that will improve your performance, your recovery, and your longevity. 247health.com believes that wellness is a personal journey, but it's always good to have a friend who knows what they're talking about, too. Give them a try at 247health.com. Did you know many of 247health.com's favorite products, like avocado oil mayonnaise, hydrating ketone water, skin revitalizing red light lamps, all are featured on the Daily Tonic with discount codes? If you see a cool new product on the website, there's probably a special link on the Daily Tonic. Plus, the Daily Tonic also features new wellness products with special discounts every single day. To subscribe, go to 247health.com and click on the Daily Tonic button at the top of the webpage. Yeah, okay, easier. right. So the reason it goes up is that uh, ERCOT sets the price of energy based on the most expensive power that they have to use. So when the demand is low, all they're using is very cheap wind and solar and some natural gas. So that, that power is dirt cheap. Uh, and the price of energy is pretty low. As demand goes up, they have to start adding in more expensive energy. And as they're adding in more expensive energy, they price all energy at the price of the most expensive energy they have to include. So as the demand goes up, the price, the, the wholesale price of energy that ERCOT's charging utilities that provide energy for the consumers, that goes up very rapidly with demand. And so that actually turns out to be a big effect. The fact that as the temperature goes up, demand goes up, demand drives the not, not only the amount of energy, but drives the price of every unit of energy up. And that turns out to mean that um, over the last decade, Texans paid about 30 percent more for energy than they would have if the climate uh, hadn't warmed. And so, you know, if you're paying three or four hundred dollars in a month for electricity, that means that, you know, one hundred and fifty dollars of that is a climate tax. How can it be? What do you mean? How much have the temperatures gone up on average? Te- well, they temperatures- hadn't gone up very much at all. I mean, is this future or is this now? No, this is this is the temperature of like. So 2022 was about two degrees Celsius or about four degrees Fahrenheit. This is the summer. Summer of 2022 is about four degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the second half of the 20th century in Texas. This is Texas average temperature. So that four degrees drives a lot, uh, drives more demand because people are running their air conditioner more and that has really jacked up the price. So, I mean, the price, when the price, when the demand exceeds in Texas, I mean, I I realize your listeners probably aren't that uh, familiar with these numbers, but I'll just say that when the, when the demand gets close to the, the maximum limit of ERCOT, the price very rapidly rises to 10 times the price when the demand is low. I mean, it is a huge increase in price. You know, during the blackout, the price went up by a factor of a a hundred compared to the normal prices. So during a hot summer day, the price could be 10 times what it is during a, a normal summer day. And so if you have a bunch of hot summer days, in a, during a, a month, you don't have to have that many, and you end up paying much more for electricity. Right, and why is that? Why is it more expensive as it, uh, the system gets used more? That's just the way the market is set up. I mean, the, the, the Texas energy market doesn't have to be set up this way, but that's the way they've decided they're going to price energy. They're going to set the price at the equal to the price of the most expensive producer they have to use, sort of the marginal cost of they're saying the price of the marginal cost of the next unit of energy. That's kind of the economic speak, is it? And they could do it a different way, but that's 
That's the way they've chosen to do it. So part of it, the increased demand, there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, as, as the temperature goes up, people are going to use more energy. Can't get, a, can't get around that. But the other part about how the, about the increase in prices, that is something that could be solved with a different market design. But, you know, that's not the market we have. Is it required to be that way or is it is that just how Texas grid is priced? Is it all grids that are like that? I mean, I don't understand the basis for this. Why? Well, I mean, it has to be that way in the sense that that's the way the law was written. So Texas deregulated the energy market in the early 2000s. But the thing you have to understand is there's no such thing as a truly free market energy system because there have to be rules. You can't, you can't just have a, a wild west like, you know, when it comes to like ballpoint pens, you can have everybody set the price, whatever they want. And it doesn't really matter. But with, with energy, energy is a public good and it's, it's, it has to be delivered over a grid. So there have to be rules about how the grid is used and the price people pay. You, you really can't have a truly free market system. And so there have to be rules in the market. And the way that the Texas legislature set the rules, that's the way it works. You know, to be honest, I don't know that much about sort of across the whole U.S. how many other systems do the same thing. But, you know, for example, California has a very similar market mechanism, although there are some differences in, in how the how the in the details of the market. But there are lots of places that or at least th- there are several other places that also set up this marginal cost pricing of of energy for the grid. But it's a real it's a real problem and it goes to show you that the impacts that climate change has on us is not just an impact of the climate change, but it's also impacted by the choices we the humans make. And it kind of emphasizes something which I think is important, which is that you know there are no truly natural disasters in the world. The disasters are, you know, but when bad things happen because of 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 the weather or because of climate, it's almost always a combination of something happening with the climate system or the weather system combined with the choices that humans make. So, you know, one example of this that's going on right now is, um, in you know, we have a hurricane heading towards Tampa Bay and, you know, it may not hit it, but if it does, Tampa Bay is one of the most vulnerable cities for storm surge because of the shape of the bay. And so if you get you you can easily get a wall of water 10 or 20 feet high going up Tampa Bay and just wiping it. It's going to wipe out, you know, a lot of the city. And you got to realize that that's not really a natural disaster because people built the city there when they knew that was a risk. And so, you know, when you look at anything, whether it's the ERCOT energy market or the impacts from a hurricane, you have to realize that a lot of the impacts come from the choices that humans make, not just from uh, Mother Nature. How, how could you know that a weather event is natural or not natural? I mean, they're all natural. People have made choices about where they live and where they build for you know 100,000 years. I mean, so what, what are we saying? Like, oh, they chose to live there, oh, well, or, or what do you mean? I'm not sure what you're, your, your point you're coming to is. Well, I'm trying to say, oh, I was making a point really about uh, the fact that when you see people being impacted, by by weather or climate, you have to realize in almost all cases, it's a combination of the weather and the climate, but also decisions that we as humans make. So the decision to build in a place where you know is vulnerable to storm surge or the decision to set up the Texas energy market in a certain way, those decisions have consequences. And, you know, I think, you know, we need to be smarter about how we set up the world because as the climate changes, you know, these kinds of impacts are going to get bigger and bigger and it's going to be grim. And, you know, the, the only, I think the thing that kind of saves that saves a lot of politicians is the fact that people simply don't understand how much this stuff is is already costing us. You know, how much climate change is already costing us. Is anyone doing the analysis of the various levels of climate change intervention and the offsetting costs? You know, like there's an opportunity cost if we make radical changes, what will be the economic outcome and the damage right. to people? So, I mean, look at, look at Europe right now. They're headed for a lot of trouble. So Yeah, yeah. So let me just correct the premise of your last statement. Europe is headed for trouble because of fossil fuels. It's because Putin has cut off their natural gas. Um, it is, you know, it is, it is the entire, that 
entire situation. It, it, it shut off a lot of coal plants and nuclear plants. It can't be just because Putin shut off natural gas. They have no alternatives right now because they shut off their alternatives. Right. But they look, look, if I tell you, uh, uh, OK, you know, you're going to have this much natural gas and you have this much wind and solar. You might say, well, I'm going to turn off my uh, expensive and dirty coal. I mean, coal is a terrible way to generate electricity. It's expensive. It pollutes the air. It, it, so, you know, it's a completely rational thing if you have a lot of natural gas to shut off your coal. If, if the person who says, yeah, I'll give you a lot of natural gas, then shuts off your natural gas, you can't blame the fact that you shut down your coal plants for that. You blame the person who shut off natural gas and you blame natural gas for being able to be shut off. In a world that runs on renewable energy, you are much less subject to those kinds of whims. I mean, the entire Ukrainian invasion is a fossil fuel based war and all of the impacts are fossil. You know, Putin invaded Ukraine because he thought the West wouldn't do anything about it because we couldn't stand losing the natural gas. And I think what he didn't understand is the resolve of Western Europe to punish Russia. They're willing to take the hit on natural gas. But make no mistake, this is a strong reason why we need to get off natural gas. It reduces our national security and our energy security and our economic security. And, you know, with renewable energy, Putin can't do anything to you. Saudi Arabia can't do anything to you. But as long as we're running on oil and natural gas, we give Saudi Arabia and we give Russia, we that we let them put their hands around our necks and they can squeeze anytime they want to. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's what Europe had decided to do is allow Putin to supply them and everything. But, oh, but that's uh, right. what, what, what alternatives do they have now? Now that the the natural gas is uh, is cut off, are they going to go to renewables or are they going to continue with uh, with fossil fuels? What what do you think? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think if they had known this was going to happen ten years ago, um, you know, I think they would uh, they'd be they would have built out renewable energy and they wouldn't be in this situation. But you know, the problem is that there were people ten years ago who were telling them you should let Russia build the pipeline because it's going to promote world peace. Because Russia, you know, if Russia is selling you natural gas, they're not going to do anything to make you mad. And in fact, that didn't work out at all. And it goes, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, using fossil fuels is a big risk. And again, if they had known that years ago, they would have built out th their renewable energy supply. Unfortunately, there's a limit to how fast you can build renewable energy. You can't build it instantly. It takes years to build a lot of power. So they're, what they're doing is they're importing U.S natural gas, which raises the price for us. If you ask why natural gas prices are high in the U.S., it's because of Putin. And again, it's another reason why fossil fuels are terrible. And, and so they're importing natural gas from the U.S. They're also going to be very cold this winter. They're going to have to reduce their use of energy, and it's going to be a lot of suffering. So, or not, maybe not suffering, suffering, but they're going to be cold, and they're going to pay a lot for energy. And so they're, and they are indeed trying to reopen, at least I've heard of this. I don't know if this is right. I don't know the details of this exactly, but I've heard they're trying to reopen some coal plants. And, you know, in the short run, that makes perfect sense for them to try to do that. Even though in the long run, that's not a good long-term solution. The short term, until they can get their renewable energy up, that's a completely reasonable thing. But, you know, they're in a bad situation because they're relying on, you know, Russia, which was a bad bet. And, you know, the problem with any sort of globally priced commodity is that you are subject to the price variations of the globe so that bad things that happen anywhere will affect you. So what do you think is going to play out over the next uh, year or two in terms of uh, adoption of alternative fuels for various countries? What does it look like over the, ne well, the next few years, let's say? I think in Europe, the the Ukrainian invasion by Russia will turbocharge their move away from fossil fuels. I think this might be one of the big events in the world in our transition to alternative energy, because they really understand the risks of relying on fossil fuels. In the U.S., uh, the U.S. is is transit. We are also transitioning. And, you know, uh, we just passed the Inflation Reduction Act, was signed into law by President Biden. And I think that is going to have a huge impact on the build out of clean energy, especially if we can get permitting reform through, which I realize is somewhat controversial on both sides of the political spectrum. But I think it's a good idea 
We need to be able to build, we need to be able to build infrastructure in order to do the clean energy transition. And right now, uh, building infrastructure is hard. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people who just don't want you to build anything. And, you know, you say, we need to build some transmission lines. People just say, no, don't, you can't build transmission lines, uh, you know, anywhere near me. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's really hard to build a pipeline. It's hard to build transmission lines. It's hard to build a road. People just don't want anything to be built. But to solve the climate problem, we have to build infrastructure. And so permitting reform is really key. If you get the transmission lines built, uh, private industry will build the energy. Because as I said, wind and solar are the cheapest energy we have. So lots of people are happy to build it. It's just a, a question of getting the base infrastructure built. And I think that's going to really accelerate. And so I think, you know, we, we are transitioning away from fossil fuels in the U.S. right now. It's just a question of how fast we go. And, you know, the faster we go, the less climate change we'll have. And so we really need to move as fast as possible on this. Well, very good. Andrew, where can uh, people find out more about your work? How can they contact you or at least, you know, review your papers or see what you've uh, worked on or working on? Right. So if they, if they, if you Google me, Andrew Dessler, you can go to my faculty webpage. You can, I have on there a link to all my publications. I would say people want to know what I'm thinking about, what I'm writing. Um, follow me on Twitter at Andrew Dessler. And, uh, I always tweet out links to new papers and new analyses and things like that. Okay. Well, very good. Andrew, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's been great to be here. The Daily Tonic is a five-minute newsletter that shares science-backed health news and tips, all while getting you to crack a smile or even laugh out loud on occasion. It's a daily morning newsletter started by wellness lovers for wellness lovers that covers everything from diet and exercise to morning routines and sleep aids. To subscribe, go to 247health.com and click on the Daily Tonic button at the top of the webpage. When you go to 247health.com, to subscribe to the Daily Tonic Newsletter, be sure to check out their product reviews and special recipes. There you can find reviews on the latest health technology that will improve your performance, your recovery, and your longevity. 247health.com believes that wellness is a personal journey, but it's always good to have a friend who knows what they're talking about, too. Give them a try at 247health.com. Did you know many of 247health.com's favorite products, like avocado oil mayonnaise, hydrating ketone water, skin revitalizing red light lamps, all are featured on the Daily Tonic with discount codes. If you see a cool new product on the website, there's probably a special link on the Daily Tonic. Plus, the Daily Tonic also features new wellness products with special discounts every single day. To subscribe, go to 247health.com and click on the Daily Tonic button at the top of the webpage. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.